Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. I'm Pastor Moses. I'm so glad that you're with us here today. Every week, we release powerful messages to encourage and strengthen you in your walk with God. And we hope that this message today will impact your life. Enjoy. And I want to speak about a very powerful woman in the Bible today. I want to speak to you about the mother of Jesus being Mary and how she worshiped God and she worshiped the Lord with her song. Everybody say, worship God with your song. I want you to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and 46. And as you're, as you're turning in your Bibles, I just want to give you, give you a little bit of background about this passage here. What has happened is Mary has had an encounter with Gabriel. Gabriel began to tell her about her, her pregnancy, about what was going to happen to her and that the, the baby that she would give birth to was none other than the son of the living God, the savior of the world. And she was also told that Elizabeth had been expecting as well. And so Mary went to go see Elizabeth. And the Bible tells us that when Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, that the baby in Elizabeth being John the Baptist actually leaped at the sound of her voice. And so they... They embraced, they rejoiced, they, they shared their stories together. And so the Bible tells us that Mary stayed there for about three months. But as they had discussion, as they, they talked about what God had done for each one of them, all of a sudden Mary breaks out here in a song. Chapter 1 of Luke and 46 is a song. It's Mary's song that she begins to sing really out of her, her joy, out of her celebration of what the Lord had done for her and how the Lord was literally using her to birth the Savior of the world. In the Old Testament, and I'll read it to you in just a moment, Hannah, this is actually a very, very similar portion of scripture. Hannah, who had Samuel the prophet, you remember that she was barren, couldn't have a child, but Hannah had a child in the traditional way. Mary had it in a miraculous way by the power of the Holy Spirit. But all of a sudden, this song begins to flow out of her. And as I began to study this portion of scripture, I began to think about all the, all the songs that have been written, you know, there's probably about five or ten that we normally kind of sing at this season. But if you really actually do a little bit of research, it is incredible the amount of songs that have been written about the season, about the birth of Christ. And, and I began to think, and I began to think, wow, our faith is really a singing faith isn't it? We, this is why we worship. We have worship teams and instruments, and, and this is why we're so lively, and this is why we celebrate. Why? Because heaven sings. When, when Christ was born, and I'll talk about it tomorrow night, even angels began to sing and rejoice. There, there's worship, and there's music, and there's song in heaven, and then all of a sudden, because there's a song in heaven, and we have a, a God that sings, we have a God that dances over us. I don't know if you know that, but the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, do you know that God sings over you? Do you know that God dances over you and around you? He's, he's a God of joy and a God of celebration. And so because there is a song in God, I want you to know that God has placed a song in you. Not only does Mary have a song today, but you have a song. And really my message today is that you need to sing the song that God has put in you. Because my friends, I want you to know that one of the reasons, and perhaps the greatest reason that you've been, been put on the face of the earth is to worship worship God. We've been talking about worshiping God through prophetic declaration. Now we're going to talk about, you know, worshiping God through our song and that life song that God has placed within us. And you may be, well, pastor, you know, I don't sing well. I, I don't sound well. I'm not on tune. Listen, this is not about performance and how you sound and whether you're on tune or not. This is about the song that God has placed within you. We call it the song of the Lord that needs to be released through you. I believe that every human being, by the way, has been given a song. But sometimes we get misdirected. Sometimes we begin to sing the song that belongs to God, and we sing it for all the wrong purposes and all the wrong reasons. 
And, you know, it just breaks my heart to see how many talented people, Corey, have been, have been, been raised in the church. They've been raised in the choir. They're, they're worship leaders. And then somewhere, somewhere they lose their way. And, you know, they get caught up in the, in the glamour and the money and the glitz of the world. And, and all of a sudden they, they misuse their song. Their song becomes misdirected. But this morning for you and I, not out of performance, but out of what Paul says, making melody in your hearts unto God, I want you to release your song. And there is nothing more heartbreaking than to watch people. Have you ever watched people that have lost their song? They're just not the same people. They're, they're down, they're depressed, they're sad. But when the song of the Lord fills your heart, when you come to worship God, when you understand the purpose of your life, and all of a sudden you begin to release that song, people are impacted. People are changed. You're changed. And so I want us to notice here, I want us to stand in Luke chapter 1 and 46. This is a song this morning that Mary wrote, and you know, there's a song that is around these days. It's called, Mary, Did You Know? Clearly, Mary knew. So, Pastor Amber, there's no reason to sing that song because Mary knows, and the Bible tells us. And so, Luke 1, says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced, in God my Savior. My friends, listen. When your soul magnifies God, your spirit is going to rejoice. He says, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty, notice this, has done great things for me. And I believe we could all say that in this room. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him. You want more mercy? Develop your fear, your awe of God. Notice from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. I want to talk about that today. The proud in the imagination of their hearts and he has put down the mighty from their thrones and he has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has, helped, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her house. You may be seated this morning. Three things that I want to draw out of this passage and out of the life of Mary. Three things. The first thing, and I want you to say them with me this morning. The first thing is, God has done great things. Say it with me. Oh, come on. Say it like you mean it. God has done great things. Number two, I want you to notice that God is faithful and merciful. Come on, say it again. And number three, God keeps his promise. Come on, one more time. God keeps his promise. So let me recite them one more time for you. God has done great things. God is faithful and merciful, and God keeps his promise. Now, before I unpack this this morning, I, I want to deal with this word magnify. What does this word actually mean? I want you to, I want you to think about a magnifying glass. Those of you that uh, may be a little bit older, you know that sometimes we, we need the assistance of a magnifying glass. We, we actually may need certain corrective lenses that what? Magnify the letters. I know nobody in this room. That magnify the letters, right? That help us to see. What does it do? It, it makes an object appear, what? Larger than it really is. Now, you're saying, Pastor, how, how can you say that of God? How can, how can Mary say that she magnifies the Lord? How can you make God, who's already bigger than the universe, how do you make God bigger? How do you, how do you add to someone who's awesome? How do you add to someone who's perfect? How do you add to someone who's complete? It's impossible for us to add anything to God, but Mary is singing that she's adding something to God. She's, she's magnifying 
magnifying the Lord. She's making him appear even bigger than he really is. And he's already massive. He's already huge. Then how is she doing it? How is it possible that you and I can even magnify God? Ever thought about that? But here's the truth. There is only one way, only one way that you and I can add to God, and that is with our words. That is with our praises, that when we recognize the goodness of God, when we begin to speak about the goodness of God in worship, in prayer, when we begin to tell God how great he is, the things that he's done, when we begin to share our testimony, when we even begin to share with others about the truth of the season and the reality of the faith, what we are actually doing, Doing is we're magnifying God. It's like it's like we're putting a magnifying uh, lens on God. Now, even in in the natural, think about it. If you have a magnifying glass, right? Does that mean you're really making the words bigger? You're not. The letters remain the same, but what does that magnification do? It makes it look like it's bigger. So in reality, you're not really making God any bigger. We can't make God bigger than he is, more amazing than he is, but here's what we can do. We can actually make him appear even bigger. Why? Because of the power of our words, the power of our testimony, even the power of our song. Paul says, giving every human being a reason for the hope that is in us. And when people see the joy that is in us, not the grumpiness, the joy that is in us, the thrill of life that is in us, why our souls magnify God, then they're going to ask you for a reason. Within each and every one of you, my friends, listen, I wish the things I do to get my point across, praise God, but whatever it takes for illustration, you know, yeah, have you ever watched the movie Superman, right? You know, Superman's got the big S, and apparently the S stands for hope. Did you watch the movie? But, but I don't want you to see the big S today. I want you to see the song that is in you, the song that is in your heart, the song that has to be written and has to be sung by no one else than you. My friends, listen, nobody can sing the song that has been given to you by God. It's your song. It's your lyrics. It's your title. You need to sing it forth. You need to write it forth. You know, Frank Sinatra, years ago, he wrote a song. He wrote a song called My Way. Not God's way, my way. He said, I did it my way. Well, let's hope his way worked out for him Hmm? when he went to go see God and stood before God. You see, because when you stand before God and you tell him, listen, I did it my way, you're going to have a problem. But what's the title of your song? Have you ever thought about that? If people are at your funeral, I want you to think right now. Pastor, you're depressing us. I want you to think you're at your funeral and somebody's giving your eulogy and they're talking about you and they say, this person had a song. What would the title of that song be? What would the lyrics of that message be? What would you be singing for the world? Because people are writing songs every day. People are singing every day. There are anthems that are going out every day. And my friends, many a times, it has nothing to do with God whatsoever, even though God gave them the song in the first place. Don't get quiet on me now. What's the name of that song? You know, I thought about this yesterday. I said, well, Lord, what's my, you know, and I thought, you know, Lord, my song title would be, I Love Your Presence. Of all the songs I could write, of all the, of all the messages I could write, I want people to know that I love your presence and I love to worship you. And this is even why we called it APC Worship, because I said to the eldership, I said to the leaders, I said, I want all people's church to be known as a house of worship, as a house that worships God, that loves God, that sings and invites the presence of God. I want our lives to be filled with worship. I, I want our homes to be filled with worship. Have you, ever, have you ever experienced this, that out of nowhere, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, a song will just come out of your heart, and you're like, where, where, where did I get that from? Maybe you haven't heard about it for years or sung it for years, and I, I want to tell you there, today, you know, I'm thankful for the, the excellence of music that we have in the body of Christ, but you know, there, there was a simpler day where we would sing uh, courses, and, and songs were just so much easier 
easier to uh, memorize and sing, and they would they would just come out of your spirit because of their simplification. Listen, have you ever have you ever begun to sing to the Lord, and all of a sudden you're surrounded by unbelievers, and they go, "What did you just say?" I remember being on the on the golf course this summer. I was with some unsaved people, and I wasn't even I wasn't even thinking. I was just I was just playing golf with everybody else, and then all of a sudden, a worship song began to come out of me about praising the Lord. and And this person looked at me and he said, "You're what are you doing?" He's, now they know I'm a pastor, right? They go, "You're you're you're praising the Lord here on the golf course," and honestly. Consciously, I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. Hmm? You, ever, you ever had that experience? I said, "Why?" He goes, "You're you're you're singing. You're what is it you're doing? You're talking to God." I said, "I'm talking to God." He goes, and they said, "Yeah, you were just praising the Lord." And you know, they kind of began to mock me a little bit, and and so I was like, "Wow!" I wasn't even conscious of it. I said, "Listen, I'm a worshiper. I worship anywhere. I don't need to be in church. Wherever it is, it's gonna flow out of me." The fact that I was worshiping caught their attention because I said, praise the Lord. But if I had dropped some F-bomb or I had sang some line out of Despacito, nobody would have said a word to me. I'm just saying, listen, listen, your soul is a magnifier. So what are you magnifying? Who are you magnifying? Because the truth today is, my friends, that we live in an image of, driven society. Everything's about our image. Everything is about our reputation. Everything is about how I look and how I sound. Even though my world may be falling apart, there's destruction all around me. I got to create an image like, like I'm on top of the world and I'm conquering everything, but nobody knows the hell that is going on in my life because we are an image-driven society. We're driven by brand names and and, and, and the, the emblems that are on our cars and the emblems that are, that are on our clothes and whether we can afford it or not or how we can keep up to the people we live beside or, or go to school with and, and how we can somehow, you know, demonstrate that we're as good as they are or, or, or maybe we're better than them. And, and so some of the material things that we surround ourselves with actually make us feel better than what we're feeling on the inside. So when reality, some people are magnifying the Lord. They're magnifying themselves. Huh? They're magnifying the, the label on their watch. Your big fancy house that you can't afford. You got a, you got a $100,000 car, but you can't put gas in it. Hmm? Oh, come on. A church. I'm talking about magnifying God because he has done great things. Mary said, how great thou art, not how great I am. Hmm? But this is our world today. Look at me. Look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am. Look how, look how gifted I am. You know, sometimes, you know, Corey, even in the church world, we worship worship instead of worshiping God. You know what I'm talking about, right, Corey? We worship worship. We, we worship the gift. We worship the, the talent. We'll worship the anointing. And, and, and you know, I, I, social media, you see it. And, you're, and many times I'm like, man, are, is it really about the Lord or, or, or is it about you? Are, you? are you directing attention to God or are you directing attention to yourself? This is why the, 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 the songs on my king were, were about that. We're about the king. It wasn't even about APC. It's about the king. It's saying, I want to, I want to direct my worship to God. This morning, Corey, I woke up. I was singing your song. Literally, I was humming it. I'm, I'm putting my shoes on. I'm, I said, I said, honey, I said, I'm singing this song. It's in my spirit. I said, I know this song. What's this song? She goes, oh, honey, that's on the album. That's that's Corey's song. I see. I didn't even I didn't even know the totality of the song, but it's in my spirit. You know what? You know what it tells me that in my in my subconscious mind that when you fill yourself with the song of the Lord, you don't have to know all the words, you don't have to know all the melody, you don't have to even be on tune. But there's something that just comes out of you. Worship unto God. 
because he's done great things. Because he's faithful. That's what the name of that song was, Faithful. Because God is merciful. Because God keeps his promises. And here's what Mary said. Mary said, you have regarded my lowly estate. What is she talking about? Well, here's what we need to know. Jesus is a descendant of David. King David. Mary is of the family of King David. But by the time that Jesus is born, the family is no longer part of royalty and nobility and power. They're under Roman rule. The, 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 the glory of David is long gone. And here she is, this poor, common, peasant girl, even though she's come from royalty, the reality is that she's nothing. Nobody knows her name. No one regards her. She's just poor. She's unknown. She's a common person. And she says, God, of all the people you could have come to, you came to me of lowly estate, of humility, where nobody knows me. Nobody calls on me. My image isn't on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. Nobody wants me. Nobody understands me. Nobody knows me. But God, God, you've chosen me. I want you to know something, my friends. You may have come from mobility. You may have come from fame. Maybe you were well known at one time and you say, I came to Jesus and I lost it all. But I want you to know something. Nothing in Christ is lost. Your identity has just been found. He calls the lowly. He feeds the hungry. Mary said, you have fed the hungry and you have sent the rich away empty. What does that mean? That God's upset with the rich? No, no, no. Talking about in spirit. Because you see, my friends, when we have the attitude that we are rich, when we are proud, when we are arrogant, then many times we believe I have no need of God. And we're living in a generation that is completely entitled. And listen, when you are entitled, you have no time for God. You have no time to worship God. You have no time to bow down. Why? Because you have made yourself God. My friends, I want to say this, and those of you that are watching online, if you have yourself as God, you're in big trouble. Who's going to save you? Who are you going to hope on? Who are you going to call on? Yourself. The, they talk about the power of the human spirit. The power of the human spirit only works because God's breath is behind it in the first place. It's the only reason. Why the human spirit works is because God has made us in his image. Living in an entitled world. Living in a world that has no time for God. Wanting to strip God away from every aspect, every arena, every area. That today, whenever a politician will either quote the Bible, read from the Bible, we consider it such an abnormal thing. Not understanding that the United States and Canada was literally birthed in the word of God. The forefathers were all believers. But today, it's a strange thing to say Merry Christmas or to read out of the Bible like we're reading some evil heretic thing when in reality it is the very foundation and the reason for the blessing of God on the nations. If you want to forget God, then you can forget his blessing. Then you can forget his protection that goes along with it. No longer do they want to worship God, but they want to worship abstract, fictional characters. And, and even this week, you know, the craziness, the craziness that I'm dealing with. Listen, I, I, I went into, I, I got to tell you this story. We're, we're in Yorkdale, and um, in this one area of the mall, I don't know if it's like this in everywhere, there's, there's this one area, you know, where it says washrooms. And so we, we you know, I, I said, honey, just wait here. It's got to go to the washroom. And I go there, and all of a sudden when I get there, the washroom is a gender-neutral washroom. They had the sign. They had the symbol. They told you why, you know, why, you know, the, the, the washroom existed. And then beside it, there were two private washrooms. So you had the, the major one, the two private ones. And all of a sudden, you know, I stood there and I began to watch people. I began to watch everyday people come there, having to go to the bathroom, reading that sign, and all of a sudden, either waiting in line for the two private bathrooms to open, or literally turning around and walking away. I had one gentleman, 
never met him before. He said to me, he said to me, sir, what, he said, what, what does this sign mean? I said, well, here's what it means. It means guys and girls can go in there. And he, and he said to me, really? I said, yeah, you know, you're free to go in, bro. Welcome to the new world. And this man said to me, this is just too weird for me. I can't do it. And he walked away. Here, here's the problem. Church, here's the problem. I don't want to get on my soapbox today, but here's the problem. The problem is that we are allowing a small percentage of people to rule the majority. They, they, I'm going somewhere. They, they, now I heard that they even want to make Santa gender neutral. Santa doesn't even exist. What kind of surgery are you going to do on somebody that doesn't even exist? But you see, my friends, watch this. Here's the reality. The reality is it is attack. It is an attack on the church. It is an attack on the fatherhood of God. It is an attack on the fact that you and I, and I want to say this publicly, that you and I have been made in the image of God. Every human being, good, bad, or indifferent, has been made in the image of God. Whether you believe, you don't believe, here's the reality. You're made in the image of God. And when you begin to rip away the gender and the identity of people, what you're really doing is you're stripping the identity of God. Your God, your God, like you created yourself, or in some cases, you came from the zoo, because that's what they want you to believe, don't they? They want you to believe that you evolved from a monkey and a gorilla, huh? That's what they want you to believe, and in reality, that's simply not true, that we have been created by God, the first human beings, Adam and Eve, and from that, mother and father, get together, have babies. I believe that's still the only way to have babies, right? And then all of a sudden, what? We are made in the image of God. Therefore, it is an attack. It is to strip away. And I want to tell you something, that when you remove the image of God and you tell people they come from the zoo, then they're going to act like animals. See, when you're not made in the image of God, you no longer have to worship him. You don't have to magnify him. You don't owe him anything because you're self-made. You're, you're a self-made man. You're a self-made woman. But the reality is this, my friends. Every breath you take belongs to God. Your life is lent by God. Your days are lent by God. Your hours are lent by God. You and I, we're just dirt. Hmm? We've come from dirt. And from dirt we shall return. And that's a good way to remember yourself. You know, we, 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 we kill ourselves trying to build people up and build up their self-esteem and build up their identity. And, and oh, you got to feel good about yourself. But my friends, listen, the only time you will really have healthy confidence and a healthy self-esteem is when you understand not who you are, but you understand who God is and that he made you and he has purpose for you. You feel the hungry, the rich. You sent away empty. See what he says, church? He says, you have, you have pulled down the mighty from their thrones. You, you have exalted the humble. God loves to exalt the humble. You want to get promotion? Humble yourself. You want to get God to resist you? Exalt yourself. Be proud. Be arrogant. You see, the proud and the arrogant have no time to worship God. Because either they're full of themselves or they're full of something else. You'll get, you'll get that about 3 o'clock. Come on, either, either, either they're full of themselves or they're full of something else. The arrogant, and, 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 and many times, my friends, this, I'm, I'm just going I'm, I'm to drop some grenades right here. Many times, even in our, in our heritage, in our background, you know, we come from money, we're, we're, from, this, we're from this group of people, we're, we're, we're from that background, we're from this nation. E even I come from a nation that can, not all of them, but can be very proudful. But the reality is this, my friends, here's what Paul said. He
He said, everything I knew is lost to me. Everything I knew is gone. He said, everything I knew in the past, my background, my education, my religious background, everything I knew, he said to me, is finished. He says, for me to live now is Christ. Why? Church, can I help you? Why? Why are you consumed with issues of your nation, issues of your skin color, issues of your gender, everything that the world fights about and divides themselves about? Why are you caught up in that stuff when your cause is the cause of Christ? When clearly you're not even from this world anymore. You're from the heavenly world. You're an ambassador of heaven. Why are you caught up in this stuff? Why do you take on the victim mentality? Why do you take on the causes of the world when you ought to be busy about the causes of the kingdom? You know, they asked us to help these families. We didn't know who these families were. We don't know their background, their religion, their color. We we don't know anything. All we know is that we have a group of people that love God and want to make a difference, and they're willing to put their time and their money and their resources, and that we will literally go right to people's homes to bless people, to say that Jesus loves you no matter what your background is, no matter what your gender is, no matter where you come from, whether you were born here or somewhere else, there is a Jesus that loves you. Santa's not coming. You can stay up all night. Put out all the cookies and the milk you want. He's not coming. Not today. Not tomorrow. He's never coming. He doesn't exist. He's a fictitious character that people make up even to try and misguide others so that they don't understand that the greatest gift is Christ. Mary said, my soul magnifies. We're not magnifiers. We got, we got tiny little voices, tiny little voices. Oh, pastor, we don't want to talk about Jesus. Because people might get upset. And people might get offended. And so, you know, you really don't want to, you don't want to say anything to people today because people are going to get upset. I got news for you. People are going to get upset anyway. So you better magnify God. Huh? My sister got a phone call from the teacher because my nephew, how old is he, 10, 11, 12, 10, 10 years old. They talk about Santa and the reindeer and Goofy and everybody else that's in that tribe. I don't know. Rudolph and Frosty and all these morons. And so he says, that's not true. Christmas is about Jesus. And so my sister gets a phone call from the teacher. Upset. Telling her, you need to tell your son to stop saying these things that Santa's not real, the elves aren't real, the reindeers aren't real because he's upsetting the children and he's upsetting the parents. You see, you see, my friends, because we are living in a day where we want to lie to little Johnny and little Susie and then we wonder why when they grow up, they grow up to be liars because people have lied to them all their lives. I want you to say something. Parents. Oh, man. You're like, why did we bless this guy? Here's here's what I want you to do today. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the mall. And I want you to find a stranger who's sitting there. And I want you to go put your innocent child and sit them on his lap. I 
Pastor, don't be ridiculous. Really? But at Christmas time, this is exactly what we do. Huh? Like at Halloween, Halloween once a year, we send our kids to strangers' doors to take candy. But the rest of the year we say, oh, don't take anything from strangers. Huh? Oh, oh, don't let people touch you in appropriate places. But once a year, we're going to put you on a stranger's lap, whether you're terrified or not. I can see some of you going, honey, go take that picture down from, go take it down from Facebook and Instagram before pastor sees it. Hey, right now, scrambling for your phones. Delete, 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 delete it. Block him, block him. Hey, church, listen, listen. I, I honestly, you, you can, I know what you're saying. Listen, pastor, you got some musical note on you. Don't tell us that we're crazy. But, but I'm just saying, and I, I, I'm not trying to ridicule, I'm just saying, it, isn't, it, isn't it amazing some of the things that we do that we don't even think about what we're doing? Why? Because traditions have conned us in. And then, and then as God's people, we go along with it. I was so proud. I was so proud of the, the choir and the people that came to the mall. And there we were. You know, we were in the mall there by the good life. And, you know, we didn't just sing Jingle Bells and Frosty. As a matter of fact, I don't know if we sang any of those songs. But there we were singing a about the birth of Jesus. There we were talking about, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And you know what happened? People stopped. And they listened. And they were blessed. I had this guy, I don't know, he came from one of the, he came in from one of the, one of the shops, one of the hair shops there, and he was one of the brothers, and, and he's like to me, bro, he's like, bro, I hope I could do this right. He goes, he goes, Oh, I wish my Jamaican would come out right now. He said, he said, you leading this man, this thing, this thing yours, man. Right? At that point, I didn't know what to say. I felt like saying, I don't know these crazy people. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, yeah, I'm the pastor. He goes, oh, good vibe, man, good vibe, good vibe, man. Translation, I sense something in what those people are singing that I don't sense in other songs. Why? Because they're worshiping God and the presence of God is there. And I get it. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. I've had people come in here. They don't know what they're sensing. They don't know what they're feeling. They, they don't know God, but they've, they've said, oh, pastor, you know, there's, a, there's an energy here. There's something here. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. I sense it. What is it? It's when the people of God get together and they begin to worship Father. Then all of a sudden, he shows up. And people go, I feel something different. Something happening in the atmosphere. There's something good here. There's something good about what's happening here. There, there's a great sense of what's happening, whether it's at the banquet, wherever it is that we go. Listen, I tell you all the time, we don't have to drink. We don't have to get stoned. We don't have to do any of that. We just got to live life and be joyful. I've had people say to me in banquet halls, who are you people? What are you people all about? What are you people on? Listen, we're not on anything. We're on the Holy Ghost. Your song is going to make a difference. Your soul is a magnifier. Worship team, I want you to come. I want to read some scripture to you. I'm going to bless you. And tomorrow night, church, tomorrow night, we have two one-hour services. People challenge me, Pastor, why? Why are you doing these services? Why don't you shut down the church? Why don't, why don't you give the staff, you know, the time off? Why do, you, why do you work your people so hard? Because I don't like them. I'm kidding. They're like, amen, amen. And they do work hard, and I love them, but why do we do it? 
Because my friends, I am disturbed by the trends. I am, I am disturbed by what's going on around us. And, and here we have what we call the, the birth of Christ. What we call the holiest night of the year. Is it, listen, listen, listen. Yesterday is not any holier than today, than tomorrow or the day after. But here's what I know. It's on the calendar. And once a year, the majority of the world stops for no one else except for the birth of this baby. And if they're going to stop, whether they believe or they don't believe, whether they want to mock or don't mock, if they're going to stop, then I want to tell them here's the reason. So God bless you. You have family. Pastor, we have family. Can I tell you something? We've made an icon of the family. Some of us worship our families more than we worship God. Oh. We worship our traditions. Don't you know? We have fish. Okay. Let your fish wait. Don't you know we're with the unsaved? Are you? And what are you doing for the unsaved? Stuffing them with more cookies. Or are you sharing the message? Or why not say, hey, it's Christmas Eve. Why don't we go and worship God and then come and celebrate as a family? You don't think I'd rather be home? You think I want to do four services in two days? You think the, the worship team, the, the people that are on camera, the people that work, and, and, and you say, well, pastor, you know, we have paid people for that. Not everybody. The majority of people are volunteers. They come sacrificially. I want to be home too. But I say, Lord, I gotta get this message out. Because we are running out of time. Because pretty soon they may say to us, Don't preach that message or go to jail. Don't preach that message or be persecuted. Don't preach that message or die. And some of you come from nations like that. You know what I'm talking about. That to celebrate any kind of service could mean certain death. But sometimes we use our liberty not to magnify God. Huh? But to promote sometimes our own traditions and agendas. And church, hear my heart. I, I don't want you to leave here condemned. I, I just... There's just something burning in my heart. I am deeply concerned. Deeply concerned. And you know, here's the reality. Maybe it'll be in my lifetime, maybe not. But those that are coming, your children, your children's children, it's going to be a different world. And I don't want that generation to look at us and say, what? What, what did they do? Why, why, why were they so silent? And, and you know what people say? How did we get here? How did we get here? How did we get here? Do you know how we get here, church? Because good men and women remain silent. And we just back off and back off and back off until... There's no room for us. David said in Psalm 13, 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hannah said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and my horn or my strength is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Isaiah said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Peter said, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. 
finally Paul said this. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses. Ladies, you know what a diffuser is, right? Who through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. In the church, in every place. I just had someone come up to me. I don't know, Corey, if this is even, someone said, I'm going to Australia. Can I take the album? I don't even know if the if there's enough copies to take. But, but here's what I know, what God has said to me. The fragrance of this house is made up of you will be diffused in every place in all the world you say pastor who do you think you are I don't think I'm anybody Corey who do you think you are Amber who do you think you are we're nobodies we're just nobodies but our soul has chosen to magnify the Lord I want you to stand with me do I have any magnifiers here today do I have any magnifiers here today? Father, I bless your people. I bless your people. And Father, we bless you. And our soul magnifies the Lord. And our spirit rejoices in God, our Savior. Father, may we be the diffusers Father, in the name of Jesus, I, oh, Father, I speak and I call out the song that you have placed within people's hearts, the song of the Lord, their life song that needs to be sung to you to magnify you, the, the deep, hidden words and lyrics and sounds and, and melodies, whether we are professional songwriters or not we have been created to glorify and magnify God and I speak into the soul and into the spirit of your people and to those that have lost their way and I speak to those even watching online those that have allowed their song to die revive the song revive the song God for you sing over us and we sing to you and we bless you today in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I love you, APC. I love you. God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas in case I don't see you.